Hi, I'm Mike Banfield with Springstar. I wanted to welcome all of you to the Springstar webinar for novel vector controls for mosquitoes to transmit Zika. Um, the purpose of this one hour online seminar is to provide a summary review and integration of lethal overtraps into vector management as an immediate response to the threat of Zika with an intended goal of long-term reduction of Aedes populations. The, the Armed Forces Pest Management Board recommends the use of lethal of traps as a method for control of Aedes, but there's insufficient information provided by Springstar to stakeholders on the use and integration of such traps for vector management. The recent Armed Forces Pest Management Board Technical Guide number 47 contains no guidelines for the use and deployment of such devices, so we hope to amend that through this meeting. Multiple peer-reviewed studies conducted around the world, and recently Dr. Barrera's 2014 study, more than adequately have demonstrated long-term sustained control of 80s with an adhesive-based lethal ovatrap. This is the CDC autocidal gravid ovatrap. Springstar has placed almost 200,000 of its lethal ovatraps uh, developed from the U.S. military technology into the U.S. market with considerable success and has had successful large-scale deployments in Key West, Hawaii, and other lo locations. More importantly, Springstar proposes a fundamental change to vector management by including and empowering local citizens to become an integral part of the vector management program. And this was critical in Hawaii, where the department was stripped of manpower. They went from 2,000 health workers and 84 vector control workers down to six Department of Health employees and 14 vector control employees. Now, using community-based uh, uh, contacts, social media, there are now over 7,000 citizen vector activists in Hawaii. And um, half a year later, they're still actively growing that program. So this seminar controls uh, 80s tools, the current Zika issues and vector management, the use of social groups and includes um, uh, larval reductions and lethal of traps. I'm happy to have uh, some good keynote speakers join us today. Um, our team here at Springstar, Dr. Rebecca Heinig is gonna talk about entomology, um, Dr. and she'll also talk about the epidemiology. We're joined with uh, Dr. Carl mellon from the USDA IR4 program. And he's going to talk about uh, vector control toolbox, the current toolbox, and what may be coming down the pipeline. And as far as resistant management, we're joined by Dr. Bill Black from Colorado State University, uh, who's had years of experience looking at resistance and resistance management with his work in uh, Mexico. Dr. Ishik Unlu at uh, Mercer County Abatement District is going to talk about a new technology. It's a type of gel that creates a... Uh, uh, water-based fence to stop mosquito larval development. We also have a really interesting new larvicide. Uh, the uh, tech active ingredient is Novaluron, and uh, Rob Dupree from uh, Tunami uh, is gonna talk about their inventions and how that's a useful technology. And then Dr. Emily Best on the Springstar team will talk about uh, overtrapping, the use of autocidal uh, gravid overtraps and how they can be uh, used in programs and uh, the use of them for monitoring and mapping. And then I'll close with a discussion about uh, a little paradigm we call SOVA, socially optimized, optimized vector abatement, abatement. I just wanna point out this webinar will not and is not intended to be endorsed by any of the military cooperators, the Center for Disease Control, USDA, IR4, Colorado State, or any other organization whose scientists have agreed to make a presentation today. Each scientist's presentation is independent, they're unpaid, and is wholly owned by them or their agency. And there's no interest or ownership in these presentations given to Springstar as a result of this webinar. Um, it's the part of the agency's uh, program for the public benefit to be able to present the information here. This will be archived, so you will be able to find the uh, uh, program uh, in the future. One of the conferences, uh, recent conferences I went to was an NIH-funded con conference on Zika virus in the Americas. And it was an expert consultation to accelerate the development of countermeasures. Um, you can go onto the NIH website and see some of the presentations that were done at the time through the NIH epidemiological group and some of the NIH uh, entomological studies. One in particular I want to point out is uh, 
uh, Dr. Thomas Scott's presentation. Um, it was the, the most important uh, uh, and somewhat uh, concerning presentation. He went through and he looked at the, uh, uh, the current state of uh, Zika virus transmission. Um, he, he pointed out that uh, um, patients that did not show symptomatic, these asymptomatic patients is possibly 80% of the population, they can transmit the virus just fine. And uh, he's got a timeline of uh, pre and post uh, um, fever time that shows people are highly infected um, in that four or five day period back and forth. Thanks, Mike. Our next speaker is Dr. Rebecca Heinig, who will be talking about Zika virus entomology and epidemiology. Let's start with a little background information on the Zika virus. Zika was first identified in 1947 in a sentinel rhesus monkey in Uganda. The first human infection was identified in 1952, but the current outbreak began with reports of a new illness in Brazil beginning in February of 2015. By May, the causative agent had been identified as Zika virus. This represented the first known incidence of local Zika transmission in the New World. Since then, Zika has been spreading outward into North America and U.S. island territories like Puerto Rico. As of May 4, 2016, there had been 472 travel-associated cases in the U.S., but no local transmission. There have been 661 total cases in U.S. territories, 95% of which were locally acquired infections in Puerto Rico. Zika belongs to the flavivirus genus, which also contains a number of other encephalitic arboviruses, including West Nile, dengue, and yellow fever. And much of what you already know about these other viruses is also true of Zika. For example, most people who become infected with Zika don't experience any significant symptoms. In those who do become ill, the symptoms are quite familiar. Fever, rash, joint pain, conjunctivitis, muscle pain, headache, etc., which generally last several days to a week after infection. The reason that Zika has captured international attention is because of how it differs from other flaviviruses. Specifically, the association between infection during pregnancy and infant microcephaly. The CDC is also investigating a potential link between Zika and Guillain-Barre syndrome, but these data are still preliminary. These syndromes had not been noted in previous outbreaks and may be due to recent viral mutation, but here again, this research is ongoing. Transmission of Zika may occur either horizontally, via sexual intercourse, or vertically, from mother to child, either during pregnancy or delivery, though fortunately there have been no reports of microcephaly in infants infected at birth. However, the primary infection route is through the bite of an Aedes mosquito. Although Zika virus has been isolated from a number of Aedes species, including Aedes africanus, Aedes apicoargentius, Aedes luteocephalus, Aedes vitatus, and Aedes furcifer, the primary vectors of concern are the two usual suspects, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Aedes aegypti is particularly efficient at transmitting human disease because its strongly anthropophilic daybiter and preferentially lays its eggs in man-made containers inside or in close proximity to human dwellings. Although Aedes albopictus is more of a generalist and will lay its eggs not only in man-made containers but also in natural water holes, its particularly aggressive feeding behavior makes it a primary or strong secondary dengue vector in a number of areas. Aedes albopictus's contribution to Zika transmission is unclear, but the virus has been isolated from the species both in the lab and in the field. Because Zika relies heavily on these mosquito vectors for efficient transmission, its ability to invade new areas is in large part determined by where those vectors may be found. Unfortunately, both Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus are fairly widespread and continue to expand their ranges. This is a map of the predicted global distribution of Aedes aegypti based on ensemble modeling where blue indicates a low probability of incidence and red indicates a high probability. Here's the equivalent map for Aedes albopictus. 
Because this mosquito is more tolerant of cooler temperatures, its predicted range is somewhat larger in certain areas, particularly in North America. So what does this mean for disease risk? That's a tricky question. But Brady et al. estimated that, based on a combination of disease incidence and vector distribution, approximately 3.9 billion people were at risk of dengue infection. Although the current Zika epidemic hasn't yet invaded Aedes populations in all these locations, it has the potential to do so. So how do we prevent that from happening? Currently, controlling Zika means controlling its mosquito vector, which can be accomplished by targeting a number of key stages in the mosquito life cycle. So here's your standard adult female mosquito. She'll first mate with male mosquitoes to fertilize her eggs. Generally, female Aedes are assumed to mate once in their lifetime, though there is evidence that a minority may mate multiple times. The female then feeds on a mammalian host. It is during this stage that she may either acquire or transmit a viral infection. Finally, she lays the eggs which will develop into the next generation of viral vectors. This feeding to oviposition cycle repeats approximately once every three days throughout the mosquito's lifetime. So, returning to the control discussion, how can we combat viral transmission at each step? At the mating stage, we can use approaches like sterile insect technique to reduce mating efficiency. We can target host-seeking females either indirectly, by using repellents or physical barriers, or directly, by applying insecticides, which will be the subject of Dr. Black's presentation. Finally, at the oviposition stage, we can use lethal ovitraps to kill gravid females and their offspring, which will be the subject of Dr. Bess's presentation. Alternately, Dr. Unlu and Mr. Dupree will discuss a couple of tools available for treating potential oviposition sites and killing the larvae directly. Thanks, Dr. Heinig. Now I'll hand over the presentation to Carl Malamud Rome, who will be talking about the vector control toolbox. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carl Malamud Rome, senior research scientist at Rutgers University, where I study vector control and the public health pesticides program manager for the IR4 project, a federal state collaboration that supports pest management in small markets, including vector control. Today I'm going to be talking about the toolbox, and the first slide shows the tools for protecting from Zika virus disease. We're really talking about the toolbox today for protecting from Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, and I'll explain briefly why I make that distinction. Zika virus has been described earlier. What is important to realize in terms of prevention is that it may well be vaccine preventable, but not for at least two to three years. It may turn out to be curable with antivirals not for at least three to five years. So to protect from Zika virus today, whether we're talking about personal protection, your family, your community, or your country, we really have to deal with preventing mosquito bites. And specifically what that means are the bites from infected Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. It's impossible to tell which of these mosquitoes is infected by looking. So essentially our goal is to make sure that nobody gets bitten by Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus in an area where the virus is circulating. There's really three ways to do this. You can prevent mosquitoes, you can avoid and repel mosquitoes, or you can find and kill them. All have their value, but I'm going to emphasize finding and killing today. The reason for that is mosquito prevention with good hygiene and good drainage is possible, but it's incredibly labor intensive, especially in an era in which plastic trash and standing water interact to, to create just a multitude of effective mosquito habitats. Aggressive efforts to prevent Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus production can work with enough labor, and I'm confident that people visiting the Olympics this summer in Brazil will not have a problem. This is because massive numbers of people will be making sure that there's no standing water. But this is not a viable long-standing or large-scale prevention strategy. Avoiding and repelling mosquitoes has been recommended by many groups, including CDC and the World Health Organization. You can avoid mosquitoes by changing your travel plans, both between countries and within countries, 
by hiding between behind screens, air conditioners, or by going out, but with repellents and protective clothing. All of these are sound recommendations for protecting yourself and your family, but they don't kill the mosquitoes. They don't stop them from biting somebody else. And for mosquitoes that prefer to bite people, like these species, the disease transmission cycle will be maintained as long as the mosquitoes are there, even if you personally are protected. So for community prevention of disease, we really have to find and kill mosquitoes. And I emphasize this as a linked term, find and kill or surveillance and control go together all the time. This is the emphasis of integrated pest management. We need to know which mosquitoes we're treating and whether the risk justifies the cost and the risk of vector control. But for now, we'll assume that all vector control is matched by a competent surveillance program and we'll focus on the control aspect from here on out. We have a toolbox today for controlling these mosquitoes. It's good. It's not good enough, which is why we'll spend the last few slides looking at novel new interventions. But it's also under challenge, and this is an important consideration that doesn't get enough weight. The tools we have right now are facing increasingly stringent requirements to prove safety. And this is a critical distinction. Products, when they leave the toolbox, are not known to be harmful. The challenge is they're not profitable enough to justify very large expensive studies to prove harmlessness. And this isn't just an abstract concern. Within the last year, Temifos, a major larvicide, resmethrin, a major adulticide, were canceled. Alethrin, the basis for most mosquito coils and other spatial bite protection, will be canceled at the end of 2016. And Agnique, a significant larvicide, is disappearing, not because of a formal regulatory cancellation, but because a feedstock material is no longer available and reformulating the product, proving the safety of the new manufacturing methods and the new product is not cost effective for the company. In addition to products that we know are going away, we have a number of important products that are at high risk. The second point doesn't mean they pose a high risk to human health. What it means is that because of possible risk to human health, there's a high regulatory risk to chlorpyrifos in particular and to the organophosphates generally. EPA is demanding increasingly stringent data to demonstrate that subtle effects on human health are mitigated and do not occur. This is a great goal. The problem is it poses a risk of posing such very, very expensive and high requirements for proving safety that we simply would not have any organophosphates available. This is critically important because the only chemical classes registered for controlling adult mosquitoes are pyrethroids, which have significant resistance concerns, and the organophosphates. With only two classes of chemicals available, it's critical that we don't lose one. In addition to the human health risk, ecological risk, primarily endangered species and pollinators, are very much on the mind of regulators and of anybody who uses these products. We're working closely with the regulatory agencies to provide the data they've asked for, but candidly, the pilot project materials for endangered species assessments have been organophosphates, and it seems likely that any evidence of risk will lead to even more expensive new data requirements or possibly mitigation measures that make the products effectively unusable. In a review of the mosquito control community over the last couple of months, the truly critical needs have been emphasized over and over again are resistance management and the control of adult mosquitoes using malathion and NALED. And since they're both organophosphates, any general impact on that class of chemicals poses a significant risk. To summarize the status of the toolbox today for controlling adult infected mosquitoes, the pyrethroids are shown in general as yellow because of the high concern about resistance. In addition, resmethrin is in red because it has been canceled. And the alethrins are in red and white because they're in process of cancellation. In addition, the organophosphates are shown in yellow because of the regulatory burden and the regulatory risk they're facing. In short, we don't have any adult control tool for mosquitoes that we are confident will work in 
than years to come without some regulatory relief and or new products and or new resistance breaking techniques. Which brings us to new tools. What do we have coming down the pike and what can we anticipate coming in the near future? I've divided this question into those tools which are appropriate for protecting yourself and your family on this slide, and those which are appropriate for communities or local government groups on the next. On each slide, I've divided between what we know works now and we have experience with, those products which have recently come on the market and may be helpful, but that we have very little evidence of effectiveness, and those products which are coming on in the near future and further out. For protecting yourself, you can avoid mosquitoes, repel them, or repel them with treated clothing, as already noted. In the next few years, we expect to see new generations of clothing with new repellents, and after that, possibly new topical or skin-applied repellents that would be longer lasting, more comfortable, or usable at lower dose. For protecting your home and family, luckily, there's a lot you can do. Unfortunately, it's difficult to do enough of these to be sure of protection. Long-standing tools include hygiene and draining water around your house, but since 80s mosquitoes can fly up to 200 yards, this really should be done at a community level as well as at an individual level. Physical barriers like screens and air conditioners can help, but nobody can stay inside all the time. Treated nets can be surprisingly effective, primarily for protecting children that may be sleeping during daylight hours, pregnant women that may take a nap. And also the mosquitoes seem to bite more in the evening and at night than we've ever thought. And so studies using treated nets to protect against dengue, a similar vector spread by the same mosquitoes, have shown some significant protection. Attract and kill is a broad class of interventions and HS stands for host seeking. And for a number of years, CO2 baited traps have been available for homeowner purchase to reduce populations of mosquitoes looking for a host and being tricked by the carbon dioxide into a trap. One trademark example is called the mosquito magnet, others are available. Larvicides for household use primarily are based on bacterial products such as BTI that can be used in bird feeders and other small bodies of water around homes. And for controlling adult mosquitoes, there are a number of misting systems that can be set up as well as mosquito coils and other spatially active products. Together, they can do a significant amount of protection around your house, but they're really not enough and new things have been coming on the line. ATSB, Attractive Toxic Sugar Bait, is a variation on attract and kill that targets a different part of the mosquito life cycle. Currently, ATSB is available in the US market based on garlic. In years to come, we'll see additional 25B or botanical products coming online almost certainly, and in the longer term, conventional pesticides incorporated into attractive toxic sugar baits are likely. Lethal ovatraps, or LOT, form the basis of much of the discussion today, and I won't go into a lot of details, except to say that one commercially available product you'll hear about today uses DDVP or dichlorovos as a toxicant. Another you'll hear about today uses a sticky material. And finally, there's at least one other product being marketed that includes a fungus and an insect growth regulator. Comparative studies of these products would be valuable. There are new larvicides who will almost certainly be available or existing larvicides with label clarifications this year for use in potable water, such as drinking water containers outside of homes. And finally, spatial repellents based on botanicals need more efficacy data that are available and may help. In the near future, treated curtains that work similarly to treated nets, but get mosquitoes as they move inside, between the inside and the outside of houses will be available. Lethal ovatraps of new formulations and new structures are almost certainly coming online. A related technology relies not on killing the female looking for an oviposition site, but dosing her with an insect growth regulator, which she then disseminates to her larval habitats. And finally, indoor spatial repellents or bite protection systems are likely to be registered in the US based on pyrethroids. These could be very helpful, but run the risk of pyrethroid resistance, making them ineffective. In the long run, I think we'll see not only new ATSB, but also new lethal ovatraps, new formulations for indoor spatial repellents, 
and a sexy and exciting idea, but probably not practical, is a YouTube video of a laser that shoots mosquitoes out of the sky. Finally, what can local governments and other community groups do? We can focus on hygiene and water drainage. Attempts have been made to do biological control, but unfortunately, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus are very hard to control in the, with living organisms. In the larval phase, the habitats are small and dispersed and fish can't get to them. In the adult phase, they generally live indoors or in very small populations where birds and bats have been unable to control the populations effectively. Ground sprays, both against larvae and against adults, are abundant and useful and recommended by WHO, CDC, and the U.S. military, although they're not effective enough to reduce mosquitoes to zero. It doesn't take many Aedes aegypti to keep a disease cycle happening, and so while these are important, they're probably not sufficient. What does seem to be the magic bullet in community groups is education and mobilization. Again, it can be hard to sustain, but it's a key element in getting people doing the right thing. I think we'll add this year a variety of products similar to what we addressed above, but available for community or government group. Attractive toxic sugar bait can be sprayed on foliage over a wide area. Indoor residual sprays have been used for years against malaria and may have some utility against 80s mosquitoes that live indoors. And 80 surface sprays, which are also residual but applied to only limited areas inside houses, are probably very likely to be helpful um, in treating areas, for example, under beds or under furniture in dark corners where 80s aegypti like to congregate. Lethal ova traps, as well as being a household intervention, can be used in large lots by community groups or governments. And sterile insect technique, or SIT, a specific product has been submitted to US EPA using the bacteria Wolbachia as a way of controlling Aedes albopictus. In years to come, I think that we will see gel absorbents that absorb water if it can't be effectively drained in other ways new ground sprays, new formulations of lethal ova traps, and a variety of new sterile insect techniques coming on the mark. Well, Bakke, it's important to discuss in a little bit more length. There's been some talk about Wolbachia breaking disease transmission cycles, and that can happen in two ways. Significant research on dengue is using Wolbachia in mosquitoes to prevent disease transmission. In this intervention, the mosquito population does not get reduced. The risk of mosquito bites, the number of mosquito bites does not go down, but the risk associated with any particular bite can be reduced dramatically if the mosquito is unable to transmit the pathogen. As an alternative to that, Wolbachia can also be a form of sterilant where mosquitoes with Wolbachia from different areas mate, they don't produce viable young. Equally, mosquitoes can be irradiated to cause sterility, and they can be treated with a genetic construct called riddle. It's been in the news lately. Like Wolbachia, this is worth a little bit more discussion. Genetically modified mosquitoes have been discussed for years, largely in the context of gene drive, which spreads genes through a population and then reduces the mosquito's ability to transmit the disease, much like the Australian Wolbachia we discussed. In addition, the riddle gene is a genetic modification that makes it so that mosquitoes that mate with native mosquitoes do not have viable young. So I put this as a form of sterile insect technique. Finally, in the future, I think we'll see new classes of pesticides, and especially for adult mosquito control, where we only now have pyrethroids and organophosphates. This is critically important, but it's unlikely to help us for at least two to three years. Ground spray technology gets better and should allow widespread treatment of attractive toxic sugar bait with conventional toxicants. And sterile insect technique, this has irradiated, this should also be chemically treated. Mosquitoes can sometimes be sterilized effectively. And finally, RNAi means taking small pieces of genetic material, making sure they're tuned specifically to the species you want to control, and then releasing a highly selective pesticide, a great idea for generating a lot of enthusiasm, unlikely to be available for 80s control for at least two to three years. On large scale applications, essentially we're looking at is more and better spray equipment, 
in the years to come. Large area sterile insect techniques allow dispersal of the male mosquitoes over large areas at low cost. And finally, the genetically modified mosquitoes that would use a gene drive technology are probably still several years into the future. We're going to move now to some other speakers who will talk about some of these individual techniques and their status and the evidence about their effectiveness. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud Rome. Our next presenter will be Dr. William Black from Colorado State University talking about insecticide resistance. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna, um, the purpose of my brief talk is to um, bring you up to speed on the status of, status of um, insecticide resistance, specifically um, pyrethroid resistance in Hades and Gipti. So over the <clears throat> um, last 20 years, um, we've been studying the evolution of pyrethroid resistance in Hades and Gipti in Mexico. Um, 3D Mexico is sort of a microcosm for what's going on worldwide. And Mexico um, has applied the same policy for the past seven consecutive years of using strictly uh, permethrin or delta methrin as a um, adulticide and timophos as a control agent for larvae. So um, over this time period of 20 years, we really didn't start to see control failures um, until about 2005 and 2006. Um, just by way of, of quick review, Remember that pyrethroids bind to the voltage-gated sodium channel genes um, that are located along nerve membrane, and they project the gate, gated part of this protein from closing. And then this prevents recovery of the action potential, and uh, basically sodium ions come to be uh, equimolar on both the outside and inside of the nerve, nerve membrane, and this leads to loss of action potential and paralysis. Pyrethroid resistance. Um, the mechanism of it is that we target site insensitivity, and it's usually associated with the placement substitution in the gated area of the VGSD that destabilize the pyrethroid binding of the gate and allow the gate to close and therefore um, recover the action potential. Over the last um, 10 years, a uh, number of different papers have been published, indicated here in red, um, which report 10 different mechanisms. Uh, or 10 different sites in the voltage-gated sodium channel gene that confer this unstable um, binding of pyrethroids and therefore confer resistance. For the purpose of today's talk, I'm only going to speak, speak about two of these that are indicated in red here. One is called the um, isoleucine 1016 mutation in this pyrethroid binding site 2, and the other is a cysteine 1534 mutation that is in the primary binding site. So the um, genetics of this is very under uh, well understood in this, uh, Hades aegypti and other species. Basically, the idea is that uh, we need, the mosquito needs to be homozygous at either of those two binding sites in order to become uh, resistant to knockback. And you can see that the uh, isoleucine homozygotes, all of those survived after one hour per meter. Heterozygotes, or wild type and resistance alleles, uh, on the other hand, were um, almost entirely knocked down after one hour of exposure, and the valine uh, homozygotes um, all died after one hour of exposure. The point being that a mosquito needs to be homozygous for the um, isoleucine allele in order to be completely um, knocked down resistant. So, um, we we tested to see uh, how well this marker for isoleucine 1016, how predictive this was of knockdown um, in the field. And each of the points on this graph indicate areas where we've collected um, mosquitoes from the field and exposed them either to 5 micrograms of permethrin in the um, bottle bioassay or to 10 micrograms of permethrin. What you can see is that if we look at the frequency of the isoleucine homozygote, that we have a very high correlation between this maximal knockdown rate. And what we've seen, um, starting back in 1999, is a, a slow progression um, towards an increase in the frequency of these two mutations. But by 2005 and 2007, they had really started to um, build 
in frequency. And this is classically what you see is a recessive type of mutation. So that by 2005, 2007, you'll remember from the first slide, this is when the control value started to appear. And that's because that's when the isoleucine and cysteine mutations started to become homozygous. From there, they've increased enormously um, over the, the past uh, five to six years. And the one thing that we've noticed is that um, the increase in the isoleucine mutation always seems to be preceded by the cysteine mutation at position 1534. And so what we've seen uh, to bring you up to speed on almost uh, current publications and studies of these is that across the country of Mexico, we're seeing an exponential um, increase in the frequency of the um, double mutants, indicated there by isoleucine 1016-1534. This has occurred across all. Um, additional studies that we've been um, working on recently um, and address some of the uh, things that have already been brought up this morning is that we have tested our um, double mutant, um, knockdown resistant mutants against um, ITN, hence mosquito cytokine treated netting, with alpha cytomethrin, delta methrin, and permethrin. And the disturbing thing is that as repellent, these mutations seem to confer um, an insensitivity to these items as, as repellent. And so basically, using the bioassay that we developed here in my lab, we've shown that, that mosquitoes that are resistant to uh, the pyrethroids are also. Um, generally not uh, repelled by the insecticides embedded in treated materials. Um, so we've seen a reduction, uh, a fairly large reduction in the repellency of these pyrethroids. Um, and the other bit of, of bad news is that with the uh, exception of um, bifensin, um, we've seen almost complete cross resistance to all other uh, pyrethroids, whether type 1 or type 2 pyrethroids, um, across large areas of Mexico. Good news is that um, we have data, and I have a uh, student who's now taken this out for 14 generations. It shows us that in the absence of pyrethroid pressure, populations tend to revert to um, wild type. This is true both for the phenotype, or this is the graph indicates the tick drop in the K250 uh, amount, as well as the L250. And this is also true of the two mutations, by the recent mutations. This mutation taken off of selection will uh, fairly rapidly decline in frequency. You may probably have a negative fitness associated with them. The other bit of good news is that uh, pyrethroid resistance in the field is dynamic. And that is, most of the um, populations where the mutations are fixed, they're very close to fixed occur in urban areas. But if you look in rural areas, even those close to um, the, the urban areas, we find that there's been quite a, um, there, there's quite a bit of residual susceptibility to pyrethroids in these areas. You need to still go in to rural areas and expect to get good control with these. The other is that we have um, some resistance to chemifox in these areas, but we have um, still have susceptibility to store pyrophos, malathion, and the uh, carbonate in biocarb. And this is just to show you what happens if we look at, a, at an urban site, in this case a site uh, pretty much in the middle of Merida, Mexico, a large uh, uh, urban area, and you can see that pyrethroid resistance is huge in this area, but the good news is that we still have uh, this uh, susceptibility to store pyrophos, malathion, and biocarb. So this suggests possible solutions, and this is a research program that we're just starting right now um, for implementing some type of uh, rotational use of insecticides, rotating between an organophosphate like melathione, um, alternated every two to three years with pyrethroids for um, sustaining utility of pyrethroids, and then for treatment of larvae, uh, alternating with um, between uh, chemophos and Spinifex or BPI. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Dr. Black, for presenting that to us. Up next, we have Ishik Unlu presenting on mosquito gel larval barrier. Good morning. This is Ishik Unlu from Mercer County Mosquito Control. 
Here we tested hydrogel against a resolvable pictus. Uh, mosquitoes collected from Trenton, New Jersey. We had um, four concentrations to test. Of course, we had a control um, control cup, and then followed by 0.6, 0 0.9, 0 0.2, and 0.5 grams of um, hydrogel in it. We had 250 ml of water in the cup that's shown on the slide, and we basically add 0.6 for our first uh, concentration, 0.9, and so on and so forth. And then we um, observed the emergence and larval and pupil mortality for a month. Okay, here are the, the results from our larval mortality. For the experiment one, we tested 0.6 to 0.5. The range was 0.6 to 0.5. And our observation was 0.5 grams of hydrogel and 250 ml of water was an overkill. Basically, it was in a jello gel state and nothing, none of the, the larvae moved or did anything. So we thought it was an overkill. For, for, for the second experiment, we decided to, to modify the concentrations a little bit. So we removed 1.5 and replaced it by one gram of hydrogel. But interestingly, as soon as we removed the highest concentration um, and adding one gram uh, of uh, hydrogel, the, the glass changed drastically. We achieved 100% um, um, over 50, a little bit over 50% mortality with one gram and 1.2 grams it was the only concentration that we achieved 100% uh, mortality. So it seems like concentration is really, really important. 0 0.3, 0 0.2 uh, grams makes a, makes a lot of difference. And during this experiment, we used filtered water and it will be interesting to see how these concentrations hold up in the in the field. Um, but overall, based on these results, the LD50 determined is 0 0.8 to 0 0.9, and LD90 was determined 1.1 to 1.2. And we think that this uh, material in the test has the potential be used in the, the field and be a future um, item in the toolbox. So we believe that uh, we should try this in the field and uh, get further results. And we believe it has a potential to use against a container ADs mosquitoes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ishik. Now we go on to Robert Dupree, who will be talking about a new type of mosquito larvicide. Thanks for uh, giving us the opportunity to discuss our product. Uh, I'd like to introduce to everybody uh, a new mosquito larvicide uh, that we have developed. It's currently registered in the U.S. and Canada. So, muscarin, what is it? Uh, it's a new mosquito larvicide. It contains the active ingredient Nova Uron. Uh, we have two products available. Uh, you see the product names there, muscarin 0.12 CRD and muscarin 0.12p. Uh, they're both fully registered in the U.S. and Canada since 2013. And uh, at present, it's, uh, there are three states which are excluded. So the statement here is not correct. Uh, California, New York, and Connecticut uh, currently uh, have not approved use of the product. But every other state, and I believe most territories, uh, the product can be used. Uh, the product consists of uh, two formulations. Uh, they're basically the same. I'm sorry. It's the same formulation, but it's two products that differ in size and shape. 
and the uh, size of the mosquito breeding site will determine which product uh, to use. It has an excellent safety profile. It's also approved for use in potable water. Uh, it's a solid formulation. It's pre-measured, so no mixing is required. It also has an indefinite shelf life. And it will prevent successful development of adult mosquitoes for up to 90 days or longer with one treatment. So here we have a photo of the uh, two different products. Uh, on the right, you see uh, what's the CRD product. It's about the size of a charcoal briquette. And uh, one briquette can be used in 200 liters or 50 gallons of water. And on the right is the uh, Muscarin 0.12P product or the Pastel. And it's suited for use in sites that contain around 10 liters of water or less. You could also use it in sites that contain more. You simply just have to uh, add more pellets. And uh, for most of the locations, uh, if it's high in organic matter, you will have to use a 2X rate. So how does the formulation work? Uh, the formulation consists of a blend of soluble and insoluble waxes and the active ingredient. And then when the product is in, immersed in water, it begins to disintegrate into a fine particulate. The, this particulate disperses through the water and also causes a slow release of nova uron. The properties of this formulation enable the product to be efficacious for up to 90 days or longer. And the, for, the uh, formulation is very stable. Uh, it will remain stable indefinitely until it is immersed in water. So here's a bit of the mode of action. Um, Novuron dis disrupts key steps in larval development or the instar stages. Uh, larval growth occurs by shedding and reforming of the exoskeleton, which consists of chitin. And this is a complex biological process, and Novuron disrupts it by interfering with several critical enzymes. Uh, this results in abnormal development, causing mortality. And the effect on the developing mosquito can be cumulative. At high concentrations, you'll see mortality at egg hatching or first and second instars. Uh, over time, as the concentration uh, begins to decrease, uh, you will see mortality later on in development at the third and fourth larval instars. And uh, you will also see this uh, being impacted right on through uh, the pupil until the time of adult emergence. Um, so there are other effects as well. There's poor viability of the F2 progeny, and there's also evidence of transovarial activity in certain species. So here we have a uh, slide showing the uh, effect of the product on different stages of larval development or You'll see on the left, you have your control and a picture of uh, a healthy larva, pupil, and adult. And then on the right are examples of what you can see after exposure to Nova Euron. Um, you'll notice that the larva uh, are not uh, appearing robust and healthy. Uh, they have uh, physical abnormalities. And the same with the pupa. If you compare them to the, uh, the healthy pupa on the left, you can see that there is abnormal development. And often what you'll see um, over time as the concentration of Nova Euron in the treated site tends to be reduced, uh, you may think that the product is no longer working. If you sample it, you will see larvae. They appear healthy and robust. But what happens is at the time of uh, emergence of the adult mosquito from the pupil case, uh, there's problems. Uh, typically what you'll see is the adult becomes stuck on the pupil case and this leads to it drowning on the water surface. So in summary, uh, we feel uh, this product uh, has great potential for use in uh, mosquito abatement programs. Uh, it does provide an excellent safety profile. The mode of action means non-targets 
excluding insects and crustaceans are not going to be affected because chitin is not part of their biological processes. Uh, it's easy to apply, comes in a solid formulation with indefinite shelf life. There's no mixing required and it's pre-measured for different sizes of larval habitats. Uh, it has an excellent safety profile. It's approved for use in potable water. Has long residual activity, 90 days or longer, making control programs more manageable. This is a new class of chemistry, so it's an important new tool for resistance management, ideally suited for treating breeding sites that cannot be eliminated. Rain barrows, cisterns, urns, flower pots, gutters, eaves troughs, ditches, tires, any of those types of sites that uh, you're not going to be able to physically remove, uh, this is a good product for, uh, for treating those. Uh, another thing that we've seen, uh, particularly in use in tires, and it's probably applicable to other sites as well, that even once the site has dried up and then uh, you have a rain event and you get water back in there, the product will be reactivated. Um, so, uh, in summary, uh, we feel this is a, a new product that probably will fit in well with the uh, lethal overtraps that are out there and help you provide a more comprehensive vector control program. So that's a very quick and brief uh, introduction to, to this product. Uh, if you have, want more information or product labels, please go to our website. You can also email myself or Dr. Barry Tyler, and we'd be more than happy to provide you any information that you need. You should find our email addresses on the website as well. If not, uh, I'm sure Mike uh, can help you out. So, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for informing us about your new product. Now we will hear from Dr. Emily Bess, who will be giving us an overview of overtraps and how they can be used for monitoring and mapping mosquitoes. Thank you. I'm Emily Best, the research liaison here at SpringStar, and I'll be talking about overtrapping and the use of lethal, lethal overtraps for monitoring and mapping of Aedes aegypti. First, a couple of definitions. Lethal overtraps include mosquito traps that target adult female mosquitoes that are looking for breeding sites. And adulticidal or, or autocidal overtraps kill mosquitoes that enter the traps. Back in November, SpringStar presented at the World Health Organization's Vector Control Advisory Group, and we suggested that adulticidal or autocidal overtraps, or AOTs, should be defined in this way. They should be traps that target container mosquitoes by providing attractive water sources for gravid females seeking oviposition sites. They must also kill gravid female mosquitoes and eliminate reproduction. They must also eliminate larvae. The WHO agrees that overtraps are effective for Aedes aegypti. It states on its website that studies have shown that population densities can be reduced with sufficiently large numbers of frequently serviced traps. Life, expect life expectancy of the vector may also potentially be shortened, thus reducing the number of vectors that become infective. I'll show you a few designs of lethal overtraps. This was the basic trap from which the others were designed, simply called the lethal ova trap. It contains a water attractant and an ova position strip that's treated with the pyrethroid adulticide and larvicide. This was tested by Perrick and Zeichner in 1999, and I'll show you some of those results. A larger trap called the autocidal gravid ova trap, or AGO, is a five gallon bucket that holds eight liters of water that includes a plant infusion attractant like hay infusion. Inside of that top canister is a sticky trap and the mosquitoes are excluded from the water source. A mosquito will fly in hoping to oviposit, be excluded from that water source and get stuck on the sticky ova trap. Uh, this trap will be market ready in May of 2016. Currently on the market we have the trap and kill. It's a small ova trap that contains just 0.4 liters of water. And we suggest that users add an attractant, such as a small amount of plant, to create an infusion. This trap includes DDVP pesticide as an adulticide and larvicide. When the mosquito enters to oviposit, 
She gets a lethal dose of that, but it takes a couple of minutes to kill her. So she usually exits the trap before dying. In order to see if the trap is working, you can look for eggs on that red oviposition strip. This is currently available on the market and is being sold at Home Depot and other large stores nationwide. We are also working on a biodegradable version of the trap and kill. This is a paper trap. It's a paper pulp that's infused with a polymer that allows the paper to hold water for eight weeks. This trap will also include the DDVP larvicide and adulticide, and it will be ready on the market approximately in August. How do you know that the trap is working? In the case of the basic lethal, lethal ova trap with the pyrethroid insecticide, you'll see dead mosquitoes on top of the water. You'll also see eggs on that oviposition strip. In a trap like the trap and kill that works on a vapor, the mosquito will fly in, get a dose of that vapor, and leave before she dies. So you look at that oviposition strip to see if there are eggs on it. Those eggs look like ground pepper or something like that. They're very small, dark bits. And so that red color of the oviposition strip allows you to see them clearly. The basic lethal ova trap design, the open black cup, has been tested in five countries and has shown really positive results in all of these tests. Uh, over below South America, you'll see the results for Peru, Brazil, and Bangladesh. The bright yellow bar there indicates the uh, number of larvae found in those traps. And you can see that the larvae populations were reduced. Above Thailand, you'll see two tables. The top table indicates uh, the overcups that were positive for larvae. The bottom table indicates those overcups that had not been treated with the, uh, the pyrethroid. So you can see that in cups that were treated, the larvae populations were reduced. And again, in Australia, in that bottom table, you'll see that the, the bottom line on that graph indicates a, a larval reduction in cups treated with the pyrethroid insecticide. Springstar ran a test of the, the trap and kill uh, in 2010. We placed 5,300 lethal ova traps over 202 acres in Key West. The active ingredient in those cups was bifenthrin. On the map here, you'll see the red areas are the treatment areas or the intervention areas. The blue areas are the non-intervention areas or the control areas. This study was done in um, in association with the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District and several other agencies. The Florida Keys study overall showed an 80% reduction in populations. What we looked at here was how many live larvae are in these ovicups between the control and the treatment areas. And we saw that in areas where mosquitoes were increasing over the season, 133% increase, in the areas that were treated, there was just a 26% increase, which is a significant difference, a difference of about 80%. The starlight suggests that trap and kill was effective in controlling Aedes aegypti populations in this area. Further, we monitored for adult female Aedes aegypti in the area. Um, the graph on the left shows before the control measures started, week by week that um, there were equivalent populations. Once a control measure started, by week 12, we saw a 27% reduction in Aedes aegypti. And then the final graph by week 19, we saw a 33% reduction in adult female populations when using the uh, BGS traps. We also found that, uh, well, prior to the study, the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District reported to us that there was about one quarter of percent of population that was bifenthrin resistant. And uh, by week four, we were finding that in about 5% of traps that had the bifenthrin, there were live larvae, indicating that that resistance had risen to about 5%. By week eight, there were live larvae in about 22% of traps, indicating that the resistance had risen even farther. This shows that there was effective control of populations because so many of these mosquitoes were being um, exposed to this active ingredient. However, it also indicates that we needed to change the active ingredient in order to not encourage that level of bifenthrin resistance. So we did change it to a different class of insecticide, 
and we chose DDBP as our active. Moving on to the AGO trap, that large five gallon bucket trap, that's been tested in Puerto Rico beginning in 2010 and for the five consecutive years. And um, the results are really quite stunning. The two questions they wanted to answer in these studies, can ovitraps maintain reduced mosquito numbers over time? And when placed in new areas, do ovitraps reduce local mosquito populations? As you can see by looking at this graph, those dotted lines that go up and down are um, the mosquitoes in control areas, or rather in, um, in um, monitoring areas. You can see that the populations go up and down throughout the season. And the solid lines at the bottom of the graph are residential areas where three traps were placed per home. We're seeing 90% reduction in 80s Egypti populations in those intervention areas. And when an area that had been monitored for mosquitoes then became a control area by adding the AGOs, we saw that that 90% reduction occurred within about three weeks of trap deployment. So yes, the traps can reduce local mosquito populations when placed in new areas. AGOs have also been compared side by side with BGS traps, the standard for monitoring traps, um, to see if AGOs are effective as monitoring tools. And in fact, we found that they are. BGS and AGO traps show equivalent results when used for monitoring. How many traps should be used? We recommend for AGO that three traps are used in a single family home and trap and kill, which is a smaller trap, we recommend four per home. And that averages out to about one trap per person. In multi-unit buildings, we recommend more, but it averages out to about one trap for every two people. And then in public parks, stadiums, other public areas, the use will vary from between about 15 to 40 per acre, depending on what trap you use and how complex that environment is. We want to see about one trap for every 10 over position sites that are otherwise there. So it's gonna depend on how many other water containers are around. Um, a comment on the production of trap and kill. Currently in the US, we're able to produce about 40,000 trap and kill per week. That will soon increase to 400,000 per week. AGO um, production beginning this month will be at about 400,000 per week. And we'd like to scale up to um, 400,000 per day uh, on a global scale very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Best, for giving us that presentation on OVATRAPS. Now we go back to Michael Banfield, who will be closing out this webinar. Well, my topic now to, to close this presentation is to talk about socially optimized vector abatement. Um, one of the things I found after visiting uh, more than five of the cities in Brazil just recently and talking to the abatement experts there in Puerto Rico, in Hawaii, and um, in uh, um, St. Martin, found a common theme of um, overworked workers, not enough money, they're kind of somewhat disillusioned. Um, and one of the big problems was that the uh, mosquito abatement uh, staff were going around doing kind of the same jobs all the time of going into people's backyards, trying to get them to get rid of these uh, uh, sources of uh, larval breeding sites. And they come back a, a, a short time later and their, their problem seems to be if they could just get people to do what they're trying to tell them to do they could be doing a better job the other thing that they face is that uh, they don't seem to be communicating um, and reaching out to the community groups and i think there's a fundamental problem occurring that um, the communication systems between local abatement and community groups are not linked Right now, the abatements are all kind of egocentric. They uh, spent a lot of money hiring PR firms to go out and uh, uh, put out a program that might inv involve uh, TV commercials or radio commercials and banners and signs on the sides of buses. And these are these types of communications are not reaching the community groups. So what we did in Hawaii was we went to make a link between the vector abatement, the community groups, and the companies that were providing the product. And by getting these, these uh, groups linked together and to get uh, to work with the communities on more of a peer-to-peer -peer basis, we got a better result. And what we did in Hawaii is we used social media, 
we went and did um, community group meetings and we went and did meetings in Home Depot stores and we worked with the, the Vector Abatement people. And we also went out in the field with the community groups to help them set up their programs. The whole key thing that this worked around to, to implement this socially optimized Vector Abatement was these community meetings. And you can't reach out and touch people except by this. And you can ask any politician, uh, how do you reach people? You go out in the field and you have meetings with people and you touch them one-on-one. -on -one. And what we developed was a panel of, of uh, people that go out and do these presentations. And every person in the panel is important. You've got to have the key influencer in the community, as you can see on the slide here, because that's the person that stays behind and keeps everybody active. You need to have the political leader involved so that they know that their government's engaged with them and they have an opportunity to talk to those people locally. You need the vector control people and they've got to be there and these have to be evening meetings, not during regular business hours, which is one of the failures that goes on right now is the vector control guys show up at, you know, 10 a.m., two in the afternoon, three in the afternoon. You know, everybody's at work. They're not thinking about vector control. So you've got to do these evening meetings. Because it's a, a human epidemiological problem, you need that representative from the Department of Health or someone that can talk to the medical uh, issues. And in Hawaii, we had the head of civil defense who was the incident commander who could say, yeah, I'm going to get that stuff done, say it and mean it. And then we had a local expert who was the, the, the vector, control uh, vector control entomologist. And then what was really cool, the outside expert. The outside expert says to the local community, you're important enough for somebody to fly over here from the mainland or fly over here from America and talk to your community. And look, I'm gonna help your local expert be your man on, on the ground. And by putting this together, we got a completely different response from the communities. And as I said, in Hawaii, uh, we just had uh, recent orders from Hawaiian community groups where they want to be involved with our program. They want to continue and sustain the program. And they're better at vector control than the vector control experts because they take care of their own yard now. We give them the tools and the knowledge to put the tools to work. We get a great successful result. So that's our, that's our uh, seminar. I wanted to thank uh, everyone for showing up. Um, please look for it online. Our team, I wanted to thank our team, uh, Jeff Kimball, Jaden, um, Alyssa, and uh, Daniel for helping to put this together. Um, we will do this again. And if you have any questions, uh, please call us. Thank you.